Hey everybody, it's Cricket, and I'm here with my old and good friend, Matt Larson, who is the Vice President of Research at ICANN, the Informa uh, Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Is that the right title, Matt? That is the correct title and the correct organization name. Thanks, Cricket. Well, and, and we're here on just about the first anniversary of the big DDoS attack uh, on Dyn. Um, in fact, I think the actual anniversary is tomorrow, but probably easier to do this on a Friday during the workday than uh, on a Saturday and, and interrupt our weekends. <laughs> um, and we wanted to talk just briefly about sort of what, what's happened in the, the last year. Um, it's probably worth recapping the attack for those of you who have pushed it out of your memory. Uh, this was what is, I, I believe, still the largest DDoS attack on record. And uh, it was leveled against uh, Dyn, which is a company based in Manchester, New Hampshire, um, now owned, actually, by, by Oracle. And uh, Dyn is a DNS hosting provider, uh, which has a ton of market presence. They host zones for lots of big companies, lots of folks who run very popular web properties. And it was such a large attack that it knocked Dyn's name servers off. Um, they were unresponsive for hours and hours during uh, October 21st of 2016, and that meant that you couldn't get to a whole lot of places on the internet, uh, places like Tumblr and Reddit and Twitter and places like that. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about what's happened in the last year or so, what we've been working on in order to build DNS infrastructure that resists those sorts of attacks. Um, anything you want to start out saying, Matt? Any any thoughts on on that first anniversary? Sure. Well, I, I remember the day well. I mean, as uh, as you know, and as some people watching may know, I was CTO of Dyn uh, for a while and left uh, earlier in 2016. So I, I remember hearing about that and just having um, great sympathy for all my friends and colleagues who were still there dealing with that that day. Um, I think one of the things that that really highlighted is that if you don't have multiple providers, you're really at the mercy of what happens to the single provider. So yeah. some people had multiple providers and came through relatively unscathed. I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. gonna remember now. Um, I mean, some people blogged about it that, that, you know, that they had, not, not, not in, a, um, in a negative way, but in a sort of like, hey, here, you know, we, uh, we, we managed to escape and, and here's why, like just describing their situation. And I, you know, I think that, that really illustrated it. But one of the problems with that is that if you're gonna have multiple providers, um, almost anybody operating at scale with uh, really big web properties where you need really fast response, they, they do DNS tricks. Um, they do things like uh, return different IPs based on where the client is coming from geographically or uh, yeah. which autonomous system the traffic is sourced from, or they do complicated load balancing and th those are all proprietary add-on features. And mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, certainly we heard this, Dyn heard this when I was there from our customers was, you know, we, we use Dyn, but we use somebody else, a competitor, mm -hmm. and we can't harmonize the configurations because because they're not standardized, they're, they're different in each provider. Right, all you can do uh, all, sort, of, sort of via DNS the protocol is to synchronize the zone data between the two places, right? You can you can say, hey, I've got a zone that's hosted by Dyn. Um, I want ha to have, say, VeriSign or somebody else act as uh, secondary for those zones so that I've got multiple providers and you can get the basic zone data, but stuff like traffic management, there's just no standard way of retrieving that from Dyn and implementing it at VeriSign. Right, and there's really not an incentive, of course, for anybody to implement that because it, it facilitates uh, making it easier for your customers to go somewhere else. At right. the same time, uh, you know, but when I was at Dyn, we had really realized that people were going to do a multi-provider solution that, that from the perspective of somebody who has to keep their, their DNS up and their, their web property going, really the reasonable operational choice is to have diversity in providers. And yeah. so we realized that we, we really weren't being genuine if we suggested to people that they should have just a single provider. And so we were supportive of, uh, of, of that because we realized that that was the realistic solution people were going to do. Uh -huh. But I don't think that there's been a lot of, of progress on that front, has there, in terms of like standardizing some 
metadata to describe how traffic management is configured at, at, uh, at these providers? No, not that I'm aware of. And I, I tend to think it's going to be one of those things that perpetually people will talk about how nice it would be, but that we'll probably never really see much, much movement on it. Yeah, yeah, because as you point out, there's really not much economic incentive for uh, the DNS hosting providers involved. Um, I, there has been, of course, a, a little bit of work, though, on uh, the protocol side, right, to, to uh, try to resist DDoS attacks, or at least, um, you know, try to, try to ensure that uh, uh, recursive DNS servers don't always need to talk to authoritative DNS servers. Right. We, we were talking before we started about RFC. Uh, what is it? I have it on the screen. I should be able to remember. Uh, <laughs> I still have it. 8198. 8198, yeah. Aggressive use of DNSSEC validated cache. And this allows um, a recursive resolver that has uh, NSEC or NSEC3 records in its cache, which, of course, for DNSSEC allow uh, authenticated denial of existence. I, I like to describe this as if you think of the data in a DNS zone as, as bricks in a wall, uh, NSEC records are like the mortar that goes between the bricks, sort of covering all the empty spaces. So with yeah. the NSEC chain, you know exactly what doesn't exist in the zone. So when you get a query for that, if you're a recursive resolver and you have NSEC records cached, it's, if something doesn't exist in a zone, you, if it's a signed zone, you may very well know because you have the NSEC record that covers that span between the names that do exist. And so right. why, why couldn't you just simply synthesize an NX domain and, and respond? Or, or a no data answer potentially, but synthesize a negative answer and respond. Yeah, it, it's certainly a, a, a pretty clever mechanism. Uh, I, it does have, of course, some limitations. Um, in the case of the Dyn attack, um, we were trying to get positive information, right? In general, we were talking about uh, domain names that did exist that corresponded to the names of big web properties and things like that. So unfortunately, I think this wouldn't have helped in that particular case. But um, in general, it would certainly help to reduce the load and the dependency on talking to uh, authoritative name servers on the internet, right? It would, yeah. And, and this was something I remember when we were putting the DNSSEC RFCs together for the, th the third time, RFCs 4033, <laughs> 834, and 35, took three times to get it to something we could deploy. I remember we talked about this, that this was something, it's, it's sort of an obvious, not to take anything away from the people who wrote RFC 8198, but it, it's a pretty obvious optimization. But at the time, so much was going into those RFCs that we thought, you know, we, we basically had a mandate from the working group, just don't change too much. Just, just try to, don't make fundamental changes to the protocol. So it took several years to get this one on the books. Uh -huh. Um, and one other limitation that I remember that, that I, I thought of when I first learned about this, it does require, of course, that the zone uh, is signed, and it also requires that the recursive DNS server that's doing the querying uh, be configured to do validation, right? Right. You know, I, I do. Oh, go ahead. I say I do. I do wonder. You know, we we've always been talking. Those of us who spent so much time on DNSSEC first the protocol development and then the, the deployment, we, we've always wondered, well, what's the killer app for DNSSEC? And, uh -huh. you know, I think some of us held out hope, maybe it was Dane, the, the protocol that lets you put uh, certificates in DNS and use DNSSEC to derive trust in the next 509 certificate. That's the super high level summary of Dane. So, you know, we thought, well, maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe we'll use this trust that we built in DNSSEC and, and bridge it over to the, uh, to the TLS world, the web world. And that, that hasn't really happened. There hasn't been a tremendous interest in, uh, from the browser manufacturers in Dane. So that's not the killer app. But I really wonder if, if maybe this negative answer synthesization, synthesis will, will end up being the killer app for DNSSEC. I wonder if, because the DDoS threats grow and grow, and as you pointed out, it just doesn't stop every attack. It just stops certain kinds of attacks. That It, it stops that uh, detritus from going to the authoritative servers to get Right. get back the negative answer. So, you know, maybe this will turn out in the long run to be something that, that people realize, all right, we, we really have to do this. This is a reason to, to, mm -hmm. to sign my zone, to turn on validation, to upgrade to a service that support this. Yeah. Well, in particular, one of the types of attacks that occurs relatively frequently these days uh, that this does really help with is that random subdomain attack, right? Where where somebody is trying to attack maybe a particular set of authoritative name servers and they just generate uh, uh, domain names in 
the zone hosted by those name servers with uh, random first labels. Um, so you'd normally have to go back to those servers over and over and over again just to get a negative response, just so those authoritative DNS servers could say, that doesn't exist, that doesn't exist, that doesn't exist. So here's a mechanism where um, once your recursive DNS server had cached all of those NSAC records, it would just say, hey, I know that doesn't exist because I can see between you know, a.example.com and b.example.com, there are no other domain names. Yep, absolutely. So I, I think yeah. it's gonna be a big thing. I think it might take a while, but I, I think in a few years, we're gonna look back and realize that it was a pretty significant turning point. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything else going on that, that, uh, that uh, sort of followed in the wake of uh, that big attack? Do you think the, the big providers have, have uh, done anything? Have they um, spent more money on, on DDoS mitigation or put in any clever mechanisms? Uh, I'm not really aware of anything personally. I'm, I'm not either, but I have to believe that that was a huge wake-up call to, to people. I mean, we just, obviously, the, the DDoS attacks, the volume doesn't go down, it goes up. And yeah. uh, sort of every time you see one of these, you see what the new high watermark is, and you know that, that it's only going to get higher. So I would think every yeah. one of these has to be another reminder to anybody operating critical infrastructure that they just have to do everything they can to stay ahead of the bad guys. And some of that is, is, is being clever, you know, the, the, the kinds of uh, DDoS mitigation appliances and services you can buy. And some of it is just, in the end, raw capacity. I mean, you just have to be able yeah. to have more bandwidth and more processing power. But the problem with that is that's, that's a very hard race to, to win, right? Yeah. It's really a race. You can just sort of barely keep your head above the water today and hope for the best. And, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know where this heads. You know, when you, when you look, look at, uh, I hate it when people use Internet of Things to cover a, you know, a huge uh, swath of things that's ill-defined. But if, if we call Internet of Things, uh, let's call it smaller and smaller devices that have a, an actual computer in them and a full stack that are capable of being, uh, you know, relatively serious participants on the network. Look at what we've done. We've, you know, we've given light switches, refrigerators, toasters. Uh, you know, they, they all have a lot of processing power. They have access uh, to you know, many megabits per second, gigabits per second, potentially a bandwidth via these um, high-speed residential uh, connections, and and they can all be compromised potentially and, and spew out traffic. So, uh, you know, that that's what you're up against if you're providing a service on the internet is, is this this potential army of uh, a poorly managed devices that will never be upgraded. Yeah, and of course, it's worth pointing out that 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 attack against Dyn a year ago was. Uh, an attack by these types of devices, by uh, the Mirai botnet, which consisted at the time, I think, of about one and a half million CCTV cameras and DVRs from mostly the same Chinese manufacturer. And, and as you said, these things, I mean, because of the nature of what they do, these are CCTV cameras, so you, you want to be able to stream video from them, right? So they have to have high bandwidth connections to the internet. You want to be able to use them for remote surveillance, so they have to be accessible across the internet. Um, it's a it's a bad sort of uh, confluence of factors that makes them ideal to weaponize, let's say, uh, and 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 turn on somebody in a big DDoS attack. High bandwidth, direct access to the internet, as opposed to like my Nest thermostat, which has to go out to the internet via my residential gateway. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a, a a dangerous sort of situation. Well, we should probably plug our upcoming live event, which is what uh november 9th i think we have our live event right. being broadcast out of where you're not where you're sitting exactly but out of washington dc which should be a lot of fun an actual tv studio right as i understand yeah it is in fact i was uh, i was booking my my hotel to stay somewhere close by and i put in the address and the address came up as some sort of it sounded like kind of a, a, a an historic building i i don't know uh, exactly what it is, but we will definitely say we will definitely tell people uh, when it comes time to have the uh, the broadcast. So um, folks should tune in, look for an invite to Cricket Lou Live. It is somewhat embarrassingly named after me, although I think um, you will be the the centerpiece, the star of of, uh, of this next episode, and we'll talk more and in more detail about. DDoS attacks and uh, how to deal with them and about DNS security in general. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it should be fun. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for, for tuning in and please join us. If you want to register for Cricket Lou Live, you can go to www.infoblocks.com uh, and register. We'll hope to see you all in November. Bye-bye.